there is an idea as old as ideas themselves, a question really, one that is so radical and controversial it rarely moves past the idea phase, and yet it won't go away. It was with us 100 years ago, and it will still be with us 100 years from now. Some would argue that this notion itself transcends time and space and all that we can comprehend with our human minds. Yeah, it's just the idea of putting a car engine in a motorcycle. That's really it. But what if said motorcycle was built specifically for that car engine? And even more, what if the engine itself is one of the most powerful car engines in the world? And perhaps even more important, what if this whole package was completely designed and built not by a motorcycle manufacturer, but a car manufacturer. That's what we're looking at today, the crazy story about an even crazier motorcycle, the Dodge Tomahawk. The Tomahawk was not the first motorcycle to come out of a car manufacturer, and it certainly wasn't the first motorcycle to be powered by a car engine. It's rumored that Ford even tried their hand at a motorcycle, but it never really moved beyond the concept stage and was more than likely just a rebranded Harley. Early American motorcycle manufacturers like Henderson, and especially the Cleveland Motorcycle Company, they had bikes that were powered by what were essentially car engines. Even as recently as the Honda NC750, that engine was very much influenced by the power plant from the Honda Jazz. Oh, and then of course there's the Boss Haas. More on that thing later. Through history, it has always been much more likely that a motorcycle manufacturer will venture into the car world than the inverse. There just isn't much reason to do so for these large automotive companies. The profits are really in the production of four-wheeled vehicles, and this is why we see Honda and Suzuki, and of course in the early days Bruff Superior and Triumph and BMW, and many other motorcycle manufacturers moving into the car world with at least some success, some not so much. So in 2003, the world was shocked when, at the North American International Auto Show, this thing was unveiled. The Tomahawk, a full-fledged, working motorcycle built and designed in-house by Chrysler Dodge. Despite making some radical moves as a company through the 90s, think cars like the Viper and the PT Cruiser, like the other major American car manufacturers, the heads over at Chrysler had a total of zero interest in making motorcycles. But these kinds of projects usually start with an overly persistent and passionate guy, someone who doesn't take no for an answer, and in this case, there were two of those people, two rather lower level guys working at Chrysler Group who had a vision. A vision of a motorcycle powered by the now iconic V10 Dodge Viper engine. Their names were Bob Schrader and Dave Chiz. Officially, Bob worked in design and Dave was a build specialist. Okay, so they weren't lower level, but you know, it ain't like they were running the company. But most importantly, these were two enthusiasts, Dave of drag racing and Bob of motorcycles. And the two began discussing ideas around the water cooler and pretty soon the dream of making a motorcycle powered by the V10 Viper engine began to take shape. If completed, this 8.3 liter engine would be the largest displacement engine to ever be put in a motorcycle, utterly dwarfing the V8 powered Boss Haas and also the largest displacement production motorcycle, which was and still is the Triumph Rocket. Oh, and it would make roughly 500 horsepower. What could go wrong? So the two took their idea to then senior vice president of design, Trevor Creed, who wisely responded with this statement, we don't make bikes and he wasn't wrong. Not only did Chrysler not make motorcycles, none of the major American car manufacturers had ever made motorcycles. But Bob and Dave knew that they were onto something, that they could create something so unlike anything the motorcycle manufacturers had ever tried to cook up. They knew that being Chrysler wouldn't be a disadvantage in this case, and with this particular motorcycle, so they decided to take things a bit further, bringing on colleagues from Chrysler to no doubt use company time to make more detailed design sketches, and shortly after, they brought a more fleshed out version of the idea to Mr. Creed, who finally relented. I think he knew that it was unlikely that any part of the Chrysler group would ever be able to shift into full-blown motorcycle production, but that really wasn't the point. Rather, investing
investing in these kinds of crazy concept vehicles, even if they weren't of the four-wheeled variety, it fell right in line with Chrysler's previous motivation for making some pretty outlandish concept vehicles, namely they served to show off Chrysler's passion for design and innovation, and they really just sparked conversation. And boy would the Tomahawk do just that. And also sometimes, even when Chrysler didn't think it would happen, sometimes there would be so much interest that these vehicles would actually go into production, the Prowler being one of those examples. Now the entire process for making this bike started with and centered around that Dodge Viper engine. Could a legitimate two-wheeled machine have such a power plant? And if it did, what would it have to look like? How big would it have to be, how much would it weigh, and what kind of suspension would it have? To tackle some of these engineering problems, they brought the concept to Freeman Thomas, who served as the Vice President of Advanced Design at Daimler Chrysler. Thomas then assigned Mark Walters to join the project, who proposed the idea of using two front and rear wheels instead of the traditional single wheel setup, which pretty much made it a car. <laughs> And he reasoned that a single wheel would appear too thin next to the unusually wide engine, you know, think a motorcycle like the Honda CBX, and for this they drew inspiration from the four-wheeled light cycles featured in the movie Tron. Although Walters anticipated criticism from motorcycle enthusiasts who might argue that this configuration would disqualify it from being a motorcycle, apparently motorcycles have to have two wheels, what's with these guys? He believed that uniqueness outweighed convention in this example, he imagined that having Having a single wheel in front and behind the engine would create just a visually unbalanced appearance, and so they began working to design a four-wheeled motorcycle. By the spring of 2002, Walters had developed a full-scale design presentation featuring massive sketches and showcasing a borrowed Viper engine mounted on an engine stand with two wheels in the front and in the back to really give an idea of the scale of this motorcycle. And this whole presentation was then taken to Chrysler Group's chief operating officer Wolfgang Bernard and CEO Dieter Zetsch, who approved the concept. And so, the Tomahawk was off and running. Walter's task of creating a fully functional motorcycle with an 8.3 liter V10 engine wasn't simple. But in just six months, the team had taken these sketches and they had fabricated a full-scale mock-up. Both the engineering and fabrication was outsourced to RM Motorsports, a specialized shop located in Wixom, Michigan, renowned for crafting unique parts for rare and vintage race cars. Kurt Bennett of RM Motorsports was responsible really for translating Walter's sketches into what we could call a mechanical sound reality. Walter's initial sketches incorporated a front suspension design reminiscent of the Elf Honda racing motorcycle's hub center steering. Based on these sketches, RM Motorsports developed a new patented front and rear swing arm suspension setup, enabling both parallel wheels to lean simultaneously, ensuring that all four wheels maintained contact with the ground and allowing for things like counter steering. Now, if you really want to, you could argue that the Dodge Tomahawk was the spiritual predecessor to the Yamaha Nikon. It's the same basic concept, this is just a lot cooler. The wheels and engine really form the base of this motorcycle, but connecting all of it would prove difficult. They knew that traditional suspension probably wasn't going to work, so they developed a new form of hub center steering in the front and incredibly a patented form of front and rear suspension and swing arm that allowed all four wheels to be independent. And this is again what enabled the wheels to lean independently and to make it function like a traditional motorcycle despite technically having four wheels. Overall the design and then the execution is just crazy with this motorcycle. Each rear wheel, for example, has its own chain, and there are some who question whether this was actually rideable or actually had the kind of performance specs that Chrysler claimed, but everything you see when you really dig into this motorcycle does show that it was a functional motorcycle. Otherwise, why would you go to all the trouble of patenting this stuff? The thing could have just rolled in a straight line onto the display and then off the straight line. But they really wanted it to be a motorcycle that could be ridden and could, you know, for the most part, function like a real motorcycle. As much as, you know, a gigantic behemoth like this could it all be a motorcycle. Of course, it could never function like a sport bike, for example, or really any normal production motorcycle, with only an 18 degree handlebar turn and around 1,500 pounds of weight. Yeah, you couldn't just go whip this around the corners, but that was never really the point. I would assume if you were going to find a place for this motorcycle, it would have to be on the drag strip with its low center of gravity and insane 
insane 500 horsepower engine, but the complete lack of aerodynamics wouldn't help you much. Quite a few changes were necessary for the V10 Viper engine. First, they removed nine of the cylinders to make it a small single. Just kidding. But they did have to switch it from wet to dry sump to be able to have it sit so low and to make it possible for the rider to reach the ground. The large radiator was switched to two smaller radiators and the force fed air was brought over from a Porsche 911. Again, all of this goes to the idea of it being a pretty legitimate motorcycle. None of this kind of stuff is done for just a rolling concept bike. And so the end, you know, design of the bike came not only from Walter's mind, but also from a pretty decent amount of testing where there was also rumors of bounding of riders crashing, but, you know, Chrysler has always denied those claims. One of the more radical aspects of the Tomahawk was its overall look, made to match its name in really every way. When you don't have loads of preconceived notions about what a motorcycle should look like, along with a whole history including things like color schemes that you have to follow at least to some extent, when all of that is just not relevant and you're just free to make whatever you want, this is kind of what you end up with. Most of the bike's components are created out of large aluminum blocks, some of which were polished to a mirror shine, and the end result is, in my opinion, one of the craziest and most striking designs in motorcycle history. Dodge called it a rideable automotive sculpture, which I think is pretty fitting. But the big question, would the general public, and specifically the motorcycle world, would they agree? Competition was pretty stiff for the 2003 North American International Auto Show. That year, the unbelievable Cadillac 16 concept car was unveiled, along with the promising hydrogen-powered GM Highwire. Over 800,000 excited enthusiasts and journalists and executives and really everyone watched as this ridiculous Viper-powered Dodge concept motorcycle thing just completely stole the show. It wasn't even close. Okay, it did technically lose Specialty Concept Vehicle of the Year via, you know, a panel of 35 nerds, and it lost to the GM Hydrogen thing. But the public buzz was really all around Dodge's outlandish motorcycle. Sadly, this would kind of mark the end of the big American automakers trying to outdo each other with concept vehicles. It was kind of all downhill from here, but it was a, it was a good peak. The Tomahawk wasn't without criticism though, especially from motorcyclists, and most of the criticism centered around Dodge's claims about the bike's performance. If they had just released it and said, yeah, we don't really know how fast it is, but I'm sure it's pretty fast, that would have been fine. But instead, Dodge gave it a theoretical top speed of 400 miles per hour. <laughs> and a 0-60 to 60 of 2.5 seconds. The latter of which is possible, though it probably would fall apart and it's probably not aerodynamic enough, but 400 miles per hour? This was based on the fact that a Viper weighed some 3,400 pounds and had the same engine. So, you know, if this weighs 1,500 pounds, right? But see, that's not how that works. That's some, uh, that's some dodgy math. According to Jeff Carr, writing for Motorcyclist Magazine, he concurred with the chief designer, Mark Walter's assessment, that achieving speeds of around 250 miles per hour with the Tomahawk might be plausible, and that seems more realistic. Kerr's analysis was based on rough calculations indicating that motorcycles with significantly less drag, such as the Hayabusa and you know Kawasaki ZX-12R, that they would require approximately 460 horsepower to reach speeds of 300 miles per hour. Given the Tomahawk's considerably higher drag compared to those bikes, he estimated that it would need at least 700 horsepower to achieve speeds of 300 miles per hour. But again, whoever's riding this thing is just going to go flying. This this estimation takes into account the fact that drag increases exponentially with speed, and you know, that's kind of where the tomahawk fails. However, he also noted potential safety concerns associated with high-speed operation of the tomahawk. The fact that it has no wind protection means that there would be really no stable riding position, and even going 200 miles per hour, let alone 250, could pose, you know, a significant risks due to the inherent instability of the design, and also the absence of measures to prevent aerodynamic lift could potentially lead to the rider being lifted off the seat at high speeds. So yeah, it's uh, it, it wouldn't be safe. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. 
Dave Campos, a motorcycle land speed record rider, expressed skepticism regarding the Tomahawk's capability to reach even speeds of 200 miles per hour. He pointed out that the lack of a fairing to shield the rider from wind resistance could result, again, in the rider being lifted off the bike at high-speed velocity. Additionally, he raised concern about the functionality of the four-wheeled steering system at high speeds. So yeah, either the bike would probably just completely fall apart, or you would just go flying off of it. Now, the criticism of the Tomahawk, it actually goes much deeper than this, to the very heart of what a motorcycle is. The only journalist to really dig in and try to take the Tomahawk seriously as a real motorcyclist and assess it that way is Glenn Kerr in his 2004 MCN article where he criticizes Dodge's performance claims while having a clear unwillingness to follow you know, the basic tenets of motorcycle design. Obviously, a motorcycle capable of 400 miles per hour would need a fairing. Like, what are we even talking about? He states that the Tomahawk illustrates how the automotive industry considers motorcycles a lesser form of its own discipline, and so they feel entirely qualified to redesign a motorcycle whenever they run out of ideas for sports cars. And of course, to some extent, he's right. The truth is we have no evidence that anyone has ever been bold enough to take a Tomahawk even up to 100 miles per hour. It would probably fall apart. Because despite Dodge having, you know, a great and deep understanding of how cars work, motorcycles are different and there's a reason hub center steering and giant car engines haven't really been used in two-wheel applications like this. It just really doesn't work. Sadly, Dodge never let independent testers ride the bike, but they did somehow bring it to limited production with nine models selling at $555,000 per bike, all of which are probably sitting in museums and never run. So if you're out there and you're watching this video and you own a Dodge Tomahawk, let us know and bring it out into the public and let us test it out. Now in 2009, this whole saga got even funnier when Alan Milliard finished his own custom Viper powered motorcycle that by pretty much every account is a significantly better motorcycle than the Tomahawk. It follows the core tenets of motorcycle engineering. As I'm guessing you probably know, Alan Milliard is just a complete genius and a, a brilliant engineer. And this is one of his crowning achievements in my opinion. His V10 motorcycle was clocked at 207 miles per hour and it is entirely rideable and it has two wheels. <laughs> Of course, comparing Milliard's creations to really anything is a bit unfair. He really is a kind of special talent, but still it shows that the Tomahawk could have been a bit more conventional and probably worked, and it could have been a production motorcycle that Dodge could have actually sold. Still, I do think Dodge and Chrysler are owed some credit for their design, even if the thing was never fully tested. As much as making a working concept was important, you know, they were never hoping to make a functional production motorcycle, and I think the design and engineering problems they tackled were pretty impressive for a company that's never made a motorcycle. If you're looking for a modern equivalent of the Tomahawk, look no further than Ludovic Lazarus' futuristic creation that in many ways picked up right where the Tomahawk left off. It has a lot of the same features. That is the LM847. And it has, you know, basically the same suspension and steering features, but this time it's powered by a 4.7 liter Maserati V8 engine making some 470 horsepower. So it's about as ridiculous, it costs about the same, and yeah, it looks pretty cool. Despite its sheer ridiculousness, and maybe because of it, Chrysler was able to show once again that they were more than just a giant corporation looking for money. That was really what the Tomahawk was about. That they too were made up of automotive enthusiasts who were passionate about everything related to motoring, even when it's not four-wheeled. Except in this case, it still was four-wheeled. Few other car companies today, or then, would dare to make a motorcycle, and especially this motorcycle. But I wonder if it isn't time once again for a car company to take a stab at the two-wheeled problem. Who do you think, out of all the major car manufacturers, could make a compelling motorcycle? And what kind of motorcycle would it be? You know, would Jeep make a good adventure bike? Of course, Ferrari would probably make a nice sport bike. Let us know in the comments below what you think, and we'll see you in the next one. Ride safe.